Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Politics of Paganism. My name is Alex Stinley. Ahead is my conversation with Dr. Andrew Jones on Plato's Republic. And the question we're trying to explore is, what is the nature of justice? Early on, we have a definition from Thersimachus that justice is whatever is in the interest of the stronger, or in other words, might makes right. Is justice whatever serves the regime, or is there true justice? Is there transcendent justice that can be lived even in our cities? And we discuss uh, in that strain the myth or the mixture of the elements, the idea that regimes construct myths to benefit themselves. We discuss the idea of the philosopher king in particular and are trying to explore what is justice for Plato. So this is going to be the first episode. Uh, it was recorded in two parts. But we're putting it together. And the next one will be on regime forms. Also, I'd want to say uh, thank you to everyone for all the questions and comments that you've left on the last two videos. Uh, we do read them, and we're going to be answering a lot of those in our Q&A at the end of the season. Also, to those uh, who have said we didn't really treat Nietzsche and the Nietzscheans with you know, uh, laying out all their ideas and really discussing them in the first episode, we are doing a final episode on Nietzsche at the end of the series. And I want to say also, I have an essay coming out in New Polity Magazine issue. 5.2 called Philosophers in the Tragic City. And that entire full-length essay is dealing with the Nietzschean interpretation of Plato. So if you want to read that essay, it's in the issue 5.2, which you can uh, purchase at newpolity.com slash magazine. And um, I'd ask you as well, consider subscribing to New Polity Magazine. That's where all our polished written work is published. So thank you all for watching. And here's the episode. Just to kind of begin the discussion uh, where where Socrates begins in the Republic is the question of justice. Mm -hmm. What is justice? What are the different views of justice? And what is actual justice, right? And uh, really, the first insight we'd like to, to kind of to, to go at is where uh, you have the initial with conversation with Cephalus in the beginning of book one, where Simonides... Um, proposition is that justice is doing good to one's friends and doing evil to one's enemies. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe it, we could discuss. Yeah. You know, yeah. What that so view. I think, I think that, I think that Socrates begins here with justice because justice is a self-evident concept. And I know that that sounds, that's going to sound weird to us. Right. But, 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 but hear me out. Right. That you can say, it makes sense to say to anyone, what is justice, right? And they have, and, and and people can provide an answer for it. I mean, what, what I mean is just the experience of justice, the experience of there being something called justice, that there are just things and unjust things, that there are right and wrong. That experience is universal, right? Every human being has an answer to what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. Even, and, and so, and so you, we can we can begin there then. So we can say, okay, what is what? Let's try to like wrap. Let's try to uh, unpack that for a second. And then we can start to see whether or not how it's grounded, whether it's grounded, what the problems are with it. Right? Mm -hmm. But we're not we're, we're starting with a with a experience like with a with a shared common experience, which is that we live in communities that have senses of right and wrong. Totally. You say if there's a murder, it's like that's bad. Yes. Obviously, you don't you know, yeah, right. <laughs> everyone has a morality, a sense of this is just and unjust. And in a certain sense, the common understanding of it is, well, you do good things to your friends and if people are your enemies, you can, you know, you do harm to them. Yeah. And even that, because then, but then, because then the, the, this is a naive view, right? This is, we can call it the naive view of justice is that you, you benefit your friends, you harm your enemies. But even that is, as Socrates, when he picks at it a little bit, it's like, well, harming your friends or harming your enemies, I should say, um, you're not really harming them. Right, because what we mean is fighting against them. So, 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 for example, um, you know, a criminal who you who who is put in prison, it's like, well, you're harming him in one sense, in, in a very sort of superficial sense, and that you're like causing him pain. But we wouldn't say that we're harming him in a essential sense. We would say rather that we are um, attempting to rehabilitate him. We are attempting mm -hmm. to defend society. We're attempting. So <clears throat> even the harm that's done to one's enemies is right or good. You see, so mm -hmm. like, so it's a part of benefiting one's friends. 
So that's why is that's harming why, the enemy. Yeah. So okay. that's why the definition could be then re- further reduced to it is never right to harm anyone at any time. But 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 it's important then to understand that that, that becomes a tautology, right? So it's it's never right to harm anyone at any time. So if it's right to harm someone, we must not really be harming them. We must be doing good to them by punishing them, them by right. bringing them into just justice. War. It must be just uh, dis- discipline. It must be ju- it must be right to do this. It must not be harming. So so that that justice then is that th- this is the reason why it gets complicated because it's not clear whether or not justice is prior to the who it's okay to harm and who it's not. Or if we derive our sense of justice by our practices of who we fight against and who we don't fight against. Do you okay. see? Like, 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 all we know initially is that those are bound up together. So it's either we sort through these are the friends and these are the enemies and then reflect on that and that's justice. Yes. But based on kind of just we just sort. And, and the other view again? The other view would be that we determine who our friends are and who our enemies are based upon justice. Got it. Right. Okay. Right, so, right. So, so we have so. some some <laughs> other notion that roots are sorting of these people are friends and these people are enemies. It could be we share common ground. It could be we're family related. You know, it's like extended kinship. It could be we have contracts with each other. It could be any type of thing that's prior. That's actually what we're describing. When we're saying, well, what is justice? What is the 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 sorting of the friends and enemies um, in in this view? Right? Yeah. So so it it becomes. I think this is the first move of political philosophy is to understand that the order, the, 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 the moral order that grounds or seems to ground a political regime, all right, that that is bound up with the regime in a way that makes it unclear which has priority initially, right? Like you don't know, like, for example, I, I gave you mm-hmm. an example when we were discussing before we started here, or I said something like um, disciplining my children. Okay, so if you spank your child, all right, uh, one may think by spanking his child that he's doing good to them, disciplining them, mm-hmm. you know, helping them. Okay, and within that person's conception of justice, that is um, that is a just act. Now, it, another person another, in another regime may say, no, spanking your child is harming them. All right, and so that that now is unjust. Now, what's not clear is, is the regime that those two people are a part of determining whether or not they think it's right to spank their child, or is whether or not they think it's right to spank their child determining the, the regime. Right. Okay. 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 You see so what we're in a tautology here. We're, we get into a tautological circle. What we, what we can know from the beginning is that they're bound up together, and we know that the common person doesn't doesn't make any of these moves. So the common person just lives in the experience of justice. Mm-hmm. It lives in their sense of right and wrong, which is the community's sense of right and wrong. Yes. Okay. So every polity, to the extent that it holds together, believes it is just and, and believes the, 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 the enemies that it harms is actually doing them good. And the people, right? And the, the friends that it benefits is benefit. They're benefiting. So every society thinks this about itself. So what we're saying is that the initial <laughs> definition is just a description. It's a of, description. It's a dis- so what Kefalus provides in the beginning and this kind of just do good to, to friends, harm to enemies, is just describing the common experience of justice. Exactly. And and then what Socrates initially starts to to go at with that is okay, well. Right. As you were describing, if you're doing uh, harm to enemies, well, you're you're actually trying to do their good in a, in a weird way. Right. 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 And so you still haven't explained what justice is here. <laughs> right. um, yeah. What we've done, we've we've given it, we've described it, but we haven't grounded it on anything. And in fact, one of the moves that happens in this first in the first moves is to point out how what we've really done is is shifted the conversation to a different realm. So what we've said is. Okay, justice, we're going to describe justice as benefiting our friends, um, harming our enemies, and really doing harm to no one. But what we've done now is said, well, who are our friends? Who are our enemies? What is the definition of harm? How do we know what's – you see, like, we've shift, we've given it a definition, but now all the terms of the definition become problematic. 
Right. Because, right, all right, and that's where Thrasymachus comes in. Yeah, because he then attempts there. he then attempts to give a ground. He he attempts to move that into that that space. Mm-hmm. Right, and he makes the first let's say attempt at a grounding, which mm-hmm. is that justice is what is in the interest of the stronger. Right. So in in Thrasymachus's you know presentation, it's that the the ones who are stronger in a regime. Uh, construct laws to their own benefit. So if you have a uh, oligarchic regime, and then it's the wealthy who will construct laws that appear to be just the justice of these are our friends and these are our enemies. Uh, but it that notion of justice supports the oligarchs. Mm-hmm. A democratic regime will make uh, laws that benefit the people who are the ruling party and uh, will construct legislation based on that as well. Mm-hmm. And so this is kind of the first uh, instance of like a grounding in the Republic of it's my makes right. It's uh, interesting yeah. stronger. But it's important to understand it because sometimes in our in our discourse now, people say might makes right. And they've got they've got the formula almost almost completely backwards. Like what they're, they, they seem to be saying that might strength is it is good for strength to exert itself. Like so, so the good becomes somehow transcendent, and it's like it's good for strength, strength to dominate. Oh, right, right. Yeah. But but that's not the formula. That's not the way it works. It goes the other way. What it's saying is domination produces the good. Okay, so not so domination is good. Not domination is good. That would assume that good is prior. Right? right. It's it's that it's that power is prior, and that we have our notion of the good because it flows out of power. All right. That's the, the equal sign goes that direction. You see Mm -hmm. now, um, or at least, at least it can. So we can, we can, we can say, okay. So, so we can, we can say might makes right. And, and I guess read it either way. One way is, 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 um, just pure wickedness, I guess. I don't know. The other (laughs) way is relativistic good and good and evil. The concepts of good and evil flow out of power. Yes. And, 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 you know, like Nietzsche would be the most, uh, uh proximate, yeah. you know, yeah. example of this, right. uh, because it is that going beyond good and evil is the recognition that good and evil themselves are constructed. They are produced by power that they're produced so it, by power. Yeah. So you have power that wishes to exert its power and therefore constructs a world of good and evil in order to conform the acts of those who are ruled to that morality. This is something we actually pick, picked up on in the yes. in the last podcast as well. And so yeah. So the so the insight would be one of the ways to describe it simply would be, you know, if you stop the average guy on the street and ask him, what is justice? What is right and wrong? And he starts giving you answers, right? That the 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 Thrasymachus argument would be that those answers are are coming out of the power structure. He doesn't know it, right? He doesn't understand. That he thinks he's just he's talking about the transcendent good, but what's actually happening is that he's in his answer itself he's describing to you how it is that the power regime functions, right? He's describing to you the the law of the powerful, and that's mm-hmm. and the reason why it's powerful is because the common man buys it. Totally right. Okay, if he so didn't like, believe it, it then if, it wouldn't work. If he believed it was <laughs> right of the stronger. Uh, meaning it was all constructed. Ima- it, imagining a scenario in which you had a city in which everyone thinks all of the laws are not actually justice. They're just whatever benefits the powerful. It's all going to go to war. There's with no power. In yeah. It. I mean, there's no power there. Yeah. So, so, so there's, you, you see, you see the significance of the move so that, that, that morality, right and wrong justice operates within regimes and always does. And is always the basis of regimes. So the regime exists because its conception of justice holds, is holding, right? And that's, that's the, that is what it means for it to be the regime. Mm-hmm. All right. So that, that's a challenge. A, a very big one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a serious right. one. Um, and maybe I could go to Socrates' initial reply, which is, okay, well, you say, you say that justice is whatever's in the right of the stronger. Well, what if they make a law that's not actually in their interest? Exactly. Like, what if they, not knowing the people they're ruling, they make a law that actually benefits the people they're ruling rather than themselves? And they do, in that scenario, 
are you supposed to obey their justice and do what harms them? Because then you'd be treating them as an enemy. Or are you supposed to disobey and do, you know, do good to them as ruler? Like, how do you, it, it, it's almost the, the second question is, okay, if it's in their interest, do they actually know what their interest is? Like, do they actually yeah. always serve their own power? Right. And, uh, and, and, and does that actually work? Right. Yeah. And, and the answer is interesting. Um, and I, because, because one of the answers that is given here is that, is that, well, to the extent that they make mistakes in their own interest, to that very extent, they're not powerful. Like to that very extent, they're not the ruler. When they're acting against their own interests, they're not acting as ruler. That's kind of well, the first thing about supply. it. If they make a mistake, they're making a mistake based on some criteria other than their own interests. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to say that justice, so truth, goodness, all of this flows out of power, then whatever the criteria is by which they're making the decisions that aren't in their own interests are criteria that are provided by them by some el- someone else's interests. Okay, well, let's restate you, that. You so, <laughs> yeah. so okay. I, I, I think I got it. But so you're when they're not doing it purely for their own interest, they're doing it in someone else's interest. Well, the, the common man that yeah. we talked about a second ago, mm-hmm. who believes justice is what he, he he will he will act according to that notion of justice, even that he holds, even though that notion of justice is what's in the interest of the stronger. When we get into a situation where well, here's the strong guy, but he seems to be acting against his own his own. Uh, interest. It's like, well, that's the same condition the common man's in, right? The common man is acting against his own interests mm-hmm. and think, obeying justice. Thinking he's acting in his interests. He's making a mistake. The, the powerful man, to the extent that he's doing the same thing, to that exact same extent, he's not the powerful man. Someone else is. Right. But he doesn't know that, which is the reason why he's making a mistake. Like the criteria he's being given is, is secondhand. Okay, so if you if mm-hmm. the point is if you close the system in, okay, so so power produces right and wrong, power produces the criteria for decision making. So you one assumes that the powerful think it's right for them, they think it's right for them to use their power for their own interests. So they also have a sense of right and wrong. Okay, so even Nietzsche does. It is right. Mm-hmm. It is glorious for me to be magnificent. <laughs> okay, and totally. so if where does that come from? You see what I'm saying? So, so, yeah. so like, so like this, and this becomes, so to the extent you, you see, it becomes, it becomes the, the attempt to ground it becomes groundless, right? Because like to the extent that you may not be acting in your own interest to that very extent, you may not be actually the one who's in charge, mm-hmm. right? You see what I'm saying? Someone else or some other structure may be. And some other structure, some other interest is being served in through in and through your behavior. And so if power, if, if morality, or the, the criteria by which we make decisions on action are always the product of power, there is always some backstop of power. It's just if you're if you're not serving your own interest, you're not it. It's someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Someone or some structure, some something. But then they have the same problem. Right. OK, so you get in a sort of infinite regress problem. Mm hmm. Um, and it becomes it, basically what it becomes is that we've just extended the description. We still haven't provided like we've, we've just extended that description of that naive description of justice. We've just changed it and expanded it. Right. We're still flowing in a tautology. Got it. Do you see what I'm? Uh, does yes. that Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's the idea that they they themselves don't know perfectly what is in their own interest. They're still, I, and I think even there, knowing what's in their own interest, there's still some notion of the good for the self in Absolutely. ruling. Yeah, there has to be. And I think Socrates is picking up on that. It's like, okay, so imagine it's all my makes right. And do you think it's just whatever in the interest of the powerful? Then it, when you're acting against your own interests, there's a kind of ignorance there that you don't know perfectly what is to your own benefit for those under you if they they can serve you perfectly and so thereby you could actually be serving someone else's interest because it's this closed system and even in that you still have some notion of good for yourself that uh you still have some notion of good for yourself that is grounded somewhere else than might makes right 
It could just be in. I think uh, in Nietzsche's right. sense. I think it's in Nietzsche's sense. It's it's the will, but uh-huh. that doesn't really explain much. Oh, that's, just, that's just that's just giving it a name. Right. You 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 say well, it's just your desire. You you know, I'm thinking of the Gorgias where Calicles says the the strong man should allow his de- desires to get as wide as possible and fulfill all of them. And Socrates just says, okay, but what desires are you talking about? Yeah. And any that, desires? Any. So so there may be a coherent move there, but it's a it's a move into. Um, into like chaos, animalistic chaos, right? It's a move away from rationality, you know? So, so there may, I don't know, there may be a, a basic, I, that's something maybe we can talk about when we talk about um, Nietzsche more and more. Yeah, detail. totally. Absolutely. Um, because I think that, I think there may be something there, but, but I think that what we're doing here in the Republic is like you were saying that the good. So, so if, 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 if my power is, is what, the just flows out of power. So in my interest, so let's say my interest, I think I like to eat a lot. All right. So my interest is, is, is stuffing my face, just eating all the time. All right. Cause I like that. And so I'm going to mm-hmm. use my power for that. Well, where does that, why is it that, why, why is it that I think it's good for me to eat all the time right now? And why is that different? How is that? How can we see that that's different? than the common man who thinks it's good to pay his taxes. Do you see what I mean? Like, like, totally. So, because who's ser- who's being served by my belief that it's good for me to eat all the time? Probably the guy selling me food. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Probably yeah. the guy who somehow me being out of shape and overweight is mm-hmm. benefiting by my inability to, to exert military power or something, you know, like, yep. like there's a, that that if 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 it is the case that good and evil flow from power, then my ba- my interests, the the the, the cost benefit analysis, the scale of values by which I'm establishing my interests, is itself the product of power. You can't you can't initiate that philosophical move and then stop it someplace. Do you see what I'm saying? You Absolutely. can't say, well, that's true of the common people, but not of the ruler. It's like, well, why? That feels that feels fideistic. Mm-hmm. Like, why would I be, like that doesn't make sense. I have to extend that analysis now. So any place I see a criteria of good and bad, I have to now think that that's flowing from the interests of the stronger. And that's an infinite regress. So we've had our initial description and we had the first kind of grounding, but it itself became another description, right. which is uh, so we have this initial, oh, it's just doing good to friends and enemies, this kind of common understanding of justice. But then you just say, well, no, it's in the interest of the stronger. Even for the ruler, he's just making, or the democratic regime or the oligarchy regime, they're just making rules for their own benefit. Uh, but that uh, that benefit is um, is not. It's it's I'm trying to articulate it here. Uh, it it just when they don't act in their own interest, it. It, you're just pushing the problem to some other interest and there's still no notion of uh, a good that grounds justice. Like you, you've, you've made the problem grander. You've pushed it further. Yeah. It's a process of, of sort of kicking the can down the street. Do you know what I mean? So, 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 so for example, when, when Socrates asked the question, um, okay, well, if, if we're going to have a powerful grouping of people, so they're powerful, they're group, a grouping because one man, you know, one man's power is, in of itself, just one man, right? Mm. Okay, so so we have a grouping of people, and they have power. Well, and they, and so there, because of that, their power is the basis of justice for the regime over which they rule. Great. Okay, we got. I got that. Now, do they have to have justice internally? Because, and, and the question is, do they have to cooperate um, in order to have that power? And the answer is yes, they have to cooperate in order to have that power. Well, what's the basis of their cooperation? Is the basis of their can the the basis of their cooperation can't be the same as as the basis of their exploitation of the people they're ruling over? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we've just moved the war into their grouping. Do you see what I'm so 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 that the grouping is strong is real because there's some conception of interest, so some conception of the good that is shared internal to the grouping. So the mm-hmm. band of thieves has some some justice internal to it. That's what makes it powerful. Totally. Right. Well, all we've done now is move the problem of the polity from the bigger thing to the smaller thing. Now we have to discuss, well, how does justice operate 
inside the, the community of thieves in which they would say, do good to your friends and harm your enemies. <laughs> yeah. And right. these are my friends. And these yeah. are my friends. Right. But why are those your friends? <laughs> yeah. We're, we're exactly. back to the same problem. We're back to the same back problem. To the same problem. Got it. Right. And and that's kind of the initial reply. And I don't know if I'm going to skip too far ahead, but the, you know, he, Socrates says, okay, well, we need to start trying to actually provide a definition here. Let's actually try to figure out what justice yeah. is. And, you, you know, because uh, Thrasymachus, uh, he, he Socrates doesn't feel as though he's answered Thersimachus's initial claim. Like he he says, okay, I gave you an initial, like I don't think you understand exactly. You just you've made the problem bigger, but you haven't solved it yet. But he wants to take Thersimachus's initial claim of might makes right seriously because this this is that initial philosophical move is to say, uh, well we could we could you know the difference between nature and convention. Or the difference between what is a constructed justice of the regime and what actual justice is. So Thrasymachus has made a very important first move. That's right. And Socrates wants to develop that to see, okay, if there is a false justice constructed by a regime, then what is true justice? And that's where he moves into, uh, we'll describe the just individual after we describe the, the just city. What would the just city look like? And in book three, he begins it by imagining uh, how does the city start? Mm -hmm. And it's the problem of no man being entirely self-sufficient. So, you know, if he was completely outside and just by himself, he'd be a beast or a god or something like that. But Mm -hmm. he has needs that need to be met. Each, Each man does. And so you need other men to do certain things in order to have those needs also be met. So... This person makes clothes, this person farms, this mm-hmm. person is a cobbler, makes shoes, you know, and and he starts with an initial like four people, then it gets a little bit bigger. You have some some more people added to that. You need stuff for, um, uh, you know, who who's going to make the, the, the tools for the farming? Who's going to make mm-hmm. the tools for the cobbler? Who's going to make? And you eventually get to this scenario in, in book three where you have this, uh, you know, big self-sufficient city that's that's working together. And but but what distinguishes it is they they only are aiming for self sufficiency, they're only aiming just to provide for each other's needs in kind of friendship. Right. And you have Glaucon's famous line that he just says, "Well, Socrates, you just created a city of pigs." Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you're creating a city of like hippies. I mean, yeah. they like sit under the trees and tell stories to their children and eat fruit that are like peaceful and nice and vegetarian. And, yeah, right. And all this right. Stuff. <laughs> And and maybe I could ask you this because it is it's something I've uh, I I almost wonder if he's poking at the idea of self sufficiency being the foundation of the city. So I think he is. So so if we're imagining like a in a in a typical sense of what's the construction of the city? Well, we all need each other. We need to uh, you know we need these different things, and everyone should provide it. And you get to the point at the very end where Glaucon's just like, that's absurd. That's not how any city actually is. So that can't be the foundation, let's say the foundational principle of the city as the lack of self-sufficiency. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. Like, yeah, do you well, think that's... I mean, the move is... I mean, isn't, isn't Glaucon's move there that, well, what about the higher things? What about um, luxury? What about culture? What about the the nice things of life, right? And and there, I think you have him exhibiting his own class. Uh, like like I'm an educated aristocrat. I want to talk about a city where I exist. You, yes. you, you, like I want to talk about a city where we, this group that's sitting here, are. Because we're not in that place you just talked about. No, there wouldn't be philosophers, right? So, so, so let's. But, but, and that's and that is important because of the discussion we just had about justice. Because it's like, well, okay, we can do that. But now we're talking about we're shifting now to talk about a regime that already has a sense of of good. It's good to to be educated. It's good to have luxury. It's good to be, you know, beautiful. Oh, you see oh, what I'm saying? So, right, so, right. so we're already mm-hmm. moving into some some conception of justice of of the good in, in our initial setting. 
Do you see what I, okay. So, so, totally. so there, which is the reason why I think the, the, the self-sufficiency then blows up. Okay. Because what does he say? What, what I mean, if I'm remembering this section well or properly, I don't know. I mm-hmm. think, I think I got enough of it to, to follow along here, but that, that, well, if, if that's going, if we're going to pursue that sort of a city, then we're going to have war. Right. And, and even if we don't pursue that being that type of a city, so a luxurious city, our neighbors might, in which case we're going to be forced to become like them. Right. So there's this sort of that original sort of city of pigs becomes exposed as, as a sort of thought experiment, but okay, Glaucon, you're right in the real world. We're always already in the problem of the, of the socially constructed or the power constructed justice constructed by power. Right. So we already are in the problem of war right from the beginning. You see what I, and this Mm -hmm. is why it's like, okay, so from now on we'll talk about, he says a fevered city instead of a healthy one. Yeah. Cause if, if it were the case, it seems to be, what he's showing with the city of pigs in book three, if it were the case that it was just self-sufficiency, we were all friends. We were just trying to, to benefit each other, to, to, to work all together in cooperation in the city, Mm -hmm. then we wouldn't have had all of these, uh, the development of all the luxuries, the private goods, the, the war, all these things would have never come about Mm -hmm. granted that they've come about. Mm Mm-hmm. City of Pigs is impossible. Right. And it, it's a fun thought experiment. What yeah. if we were all healthy, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. and like vegetarian and, and just, just getting along and just and, and happy. And and where would, and I think he asked the question in book three of like, where would injustice be in there? Or where would exactly. justice be? Like, it just seems they're all getting along. <laughs> I think, I think the point would be that justice becomes um, indistinguishable from just their way of life. Like justice is them. Right. So an outsider could describe it as justice, but they would just experience it as nature. They wouldn't. Ha- I mean, there there really wouldn't be any enemies in that. Regime. Yeah, exactly. Like what? Exactly. Are you going to say the, the cobbler's your enemy? Like, no, you make right, your, your shoes right. wrong. Like right. he's not your enemy. Mm-hmm. Where does where does. And, and I think it's very important you brought up war because that's that's kind of the end point of the luxurious city is like, yeah, well, there's going to be a lot of war mm-hmm. is because. um in that scenario, there really isn't even the initial definition of doing good to one's friends and harming one's enemies. Because if it was self-sufficient, good, happy, just, you know, we just get along. Like there, in a certain sense, there's not even justice or injustice there. There's just a kind of experience of justice. Uh, well, right. Like you can describe it from the outside like you're describing, but it's, yeah. it's not there. Yep. And what strikes me in the shift uh, where it moves when Glaucon says this is just a city of pigs. Let's let's actually talk about a luxurious city. Is that it's kind of the it's almost like a claim on human nature that human nature is not actually satisfied with just self sufficient good. Mm-hmm. There's something about human nature that strives for luxury and strives for conquering and strives for power and. That is basically taken as a given for the rest of the the republic mm-hmm. that, okay, we've got out of the way that we're not a, a good, perfect, you know, just human nature. We desire grander things. And if that's the case, then war will, uh, war, violence, striving, regime change in book eight, all of those things will be, those are what we're talking about when we're talking about politics. Mm-hmm. We can't imagine a perfect, pure nature, hippie thing yeah it's really edenic isn't it it's a it's an eden type situation and 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 in that original eden type situation there's no the self-sufficiency of it has no limit like it's perfectly ima- it's perfectly we're perfectly capable of imagining that society of pigs or whatever you know that 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 original community to just sort of expand over the entire face of the earth right like there's no because there's no war there's no competition there's no fight there's no there's no need for it to ever stop, right? I mean, mm-hmm. like, and and that that once you get to the luxurious city, now we have a problem. We have the problem of borders because at this point, the only way, and this is recognized right at the beginning, that, that the only way to amass the luxuries that are going to provide these higher cultural goods um, is uh, is basically stealing from your neighbors. So so there has to be. <laughs> 
there has to be the extraction of surplus, as Marx would say. Okay, right? Like, like so, you have to. There has to be some someone is going to be that common man who is believing as believing or somehow subjected to the the right and wrong, the just, unjust of the powerful, and 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 be mistaken about that, and so have his labor, his work, his his contribution to the world being a, a portion of that being extracted from him. Totally. Okay. And so once once you've established that, then you've got the in, an inside outside problem, right? Like who's in that band that is going to have some who's going to have some unity together that to extract from the ones who are outside. And how do we make the the that band have a unity in, internal to itself? Right? Now we can start talking about a city you know, with a, with like a wall around it. <laughs> I mean, like something. You don't need has, walls in the city of pigs. Yeah, something, yeah, that, has, some, something that has a in, a border. You have to. Okay, so just to restate, you have to have. If it's going to be luxurious, there has to be somewhere you're extracting from. Yeah. There has to be some other that's outside of of now a constructed justice of internal to the city mm-hmm. that uh, you can uh, take from in order for there to be luxuries. Um, and, and so that, that is the initial step that then explains war is, uh, both that if internally that band of warriors that's going to, 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 uh, enact war to extract from the outside, um, that they need to go there if they want to supply their own luxury, but also it's the fear of the outside, it's Absolutely. the fear. It's the, the fear similar. that the neighbors. Yeah, right. Like you could yeah. be the Greek city states, but Persia might exactly. Yeah, might want right, to take right, that right, over. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is this is is sort of forced upon you. Right. Totally. And and I, it, I think it brings us. You know, uh, just thinking about the last podcast on Augustine, this this fear notion. I mean, it 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 really ends up becoming a uh, a fear based um, political ordering because you're you're. The others are afraid of your your conquering them and extracting their luxury. You yourself are afraid of bigger powers mm-hmm. that can extract luxury from you, goods, and, and and benefit. And so each of the regimes ends up becoming much more militarized. And actually, it's really the necessity. And I'm skipping ahead a little bit. We can bring it back. But you know, the the idea of the the guardians really is that kind of. Um, uh, saying, granted, is the case that men strive after luxury and greed. We will need to have a very good military class. Mm-hmm. Like we will need to have a guardian class that can distinguish friend from foe, can be vicious against their enemies, can be good to their friends. And now we have to talk about the reality of war in the city. Yeah. Uh, and and this is just how we have to proceed. And 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 I think you know justice takes a different character then like before we were just describing a city in which justice is just doing what you do mm-hmm. um but now we're talking about a justice that actually starts to benefit the regime because to have a just war that you go against or to have justice and extracting surplus from the ruled within your city or to have another regime be declared completely unjust and must be their enemies and stuff like we you can already see how justice is now entering in a kind of right of the stronger way it, I think that that's right. I think I don't think Socrates is arguing with Thrasymachus. I think he's I think he's showing it, showing him the implications. All right. So 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 when you have the the first move into the into the city, the fevered city, the luxurious city, then the the problem becomes okay. How can I how can I have justice in the city? So in the city now. So like well, you're talking about the band of thieves have to have justice. So in the city now. We're going to have um, justice. What should it be? How should it look in order for the people who are in the city to actually achieve happiness? Okay, so so I think there, there's a arguing that justice is relative, meaning justice flows out of the the contingent political regime, is not to say that there is no transcendent justice. Right, that that, that, that those don't follow from each other. Right? It's merely to say, okay, now the problem is how to hook up the relative contingent justice that flows out of power, how to somehow align that with or hook it up to true justice. 
Do you see? Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so, and, and, and so the, the justice that flows out of the interests of the powerful is justice. Okay. <laughs> so then you don't have to argue with Thrasymachus, but you're, you know, in his point, but you're, but you're moving beyond the argument. So if the problem is, okay, so now his argument, you're moving beyond his argument, right? Like you're like conceding the point and then going beyond it because now the, the, the city, the city now has to have a unity internal to it. Um, and that, like you said, that unity internal to it always is ordered. It's like, it has, it's ordered to the happiness of the people within the city. I mean, this is what the Republic is going to be, what Socrates is going to try to do here. Um, but a, a, a non-negotiable or a sort of beginning of a, a, the, the, the conditions of possibility for the happiness of the city is the military regime, right? Because that's the only way the city even exists. And it maintains itself. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think what you're getting at here is that the, the conflict that is inherent always in the amassing of luxury, the conflict that always develops, the problem Socrates is, a, is, is a, um, accepting here is how do I move that conflict outside the city? How do I keep that conflict from being inside? Mm. Right? Okay, so how do I make it so that the justice that, so that the, the city itself is the powerful thing rather than the, the powerful in the city extracting from the weak within the city? But I want the city itself to be the, the, the grouping of the powerful whose interest is justice. Right. Okay. Yeah. And there, and then my enemies are outside. So this is mm-hmm. the, the reason like you, you, you see things that um, like where he talks about, you talked about the guardians um, and the guardians for the people who aren't familiar, the guardians are the, the rulers of the just city, mm-hmm. um, the, 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 the Republic that Socrates is going to try to explain to us. And, um, and they're themselves divided into two groups, the, the guardians uh, proper and the auxiliaries who are the warriors, but they're the same class. They have a subdivision within them. And he talks about how they have to, he, he refers to them as being trained like dogs, that um, like sheepdogs that, that love their friends and hate their enemies with instinctually. So they, they, they don't, they don't view the people inside their city as potential enemies, like the way a sheepdog doesn't view the sheep as potential food, right? It, they view them as the, the friends, and then they view everyone outside the city as the enemy. And they have animosity and aggression towards those outside. Right? But that is not um, rational. It's, it, it is, it is an, an aspect of... Um, if if this city is going to exist, they need to believe instinctually that this is right, right? Okay, so <laughs> yes. So, so the power of the city, it, its interest is going to establish right and wrong for the auxiliaries in such a way that they fight externally and not internally, because because Socrates recognizes as soon as they turned internally, they would conquer the city. Because they're the powerful, Absolutely. they're the warriors. <clears throat> and then enslave it and extract from it. Extract surplus from their own people instead of from those who lay outside, right? Mm-hmm. And and it has to be the instinct, not the reason, because they're, they just have to, right. So, it, and this is the kind of broader point of unity. Like what Plato's aiming for here in the city is a kind of, okay, granted that we have a luxurious city that w- will go to war. Mm-hmm. Let's make sure it's not with itself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, gra- granted, we're going to try to strive for luxuries. If we do it internally, this thing's going to collapse. Mm-hmm. Like, it, well, in, what, in what ends that- up actually happening is that, it, it, again, we're in a we're in a sort of um, tautological way of thinking here because if if the city's fighting internally, then it's not one regime; it's multiple regimes. Right. It's multiple bands of powerful people who have their own conceptions of justice because everyone fighting internally thinks they're right and the other guy's wrong. Right. Right. Um, so really what you're what you're having there is not the city is fighting internally, but the, the fighting of the city internally is the breaking up of the city into multiple cities. Or multiple. Groups. So now we have multiple conceptions of justice, multiple regimes internal to what we call one city but it's really cities divided against itself it's multiple human groupings right so yeah. so so the, the, the you see that you see the 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 game that's being played here it's complicated it's like well 
even in the even in the ideal city, it's engaging with the groupings of human beings outside of itself in exactly that way. Right? Okay, so 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 every grouping of human beings, regardless of its scale, has this has this problem. So I think what Socrates is saying, okay, what's the ideal grouping? How can we create a group that has unity internally in which the people achieve the greatest amount of happiness possible? Right. So there becomes an objective measure, right, to, to mm. extract, to get out of this relativistic um, tautological circle is like, well, what's the what's the what's the measure? What's the, the experiential ground? And it's it's something like happiness, isn't it? So 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 yes. so if we can organize this, if we can create a a a, a, a system of power and of interest that will then produce a justice that properly orders the soul of the people who live in that regime, then according to human nature at this point, mm-hmm. some transcendent measure, then we can we can imagine then a city that is conducive to the, the, the happiness of those within it. I mean, that's the sort of... In... It, because Plato does believe true justice does exist. Like the form of the good does exist for Plato. And when we, when we, yeah, yeah I mean, it, and, sort and of. so, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I mean, yes, exist is a hard word. Well, you're sure. Uh, but I mean, if we grant here that, like, there, if that's the case, then what we have internally is you're trying to make, tr- make the justice that's internal to keep the regime as close to transcendent justice as possible mm-hmm. to preserve the friendship within the regime within the city as much as possible in order to and and also distinguish between the enemies of the external and 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 and, and in a sense I, and I wonder if you're, you're it, it's kind of aiming towards a city of pigs kind of internal friendship where you you end up in a scenario where justice is it's there is no faction. It basically couldn't be otherwise than the happiness and benefit of all your friends is your own mm-hmm. benefit and happiness. Exactly. Like yeah, it exactly. seems as though the conditions which he sets up for this perfectly just city, where he talks about there being no private property among the guardians, about them, you know, having uh, education be entirely the same, how poetry should all be of virtuous people and there should be no imitation poetry of injustice Mm -hmm. no uh that the gods uh also all of the representations of the gods should be perfectly good and just there shouldn't be any of the stuff in homer about zeus doing terrible things or apollo changing his mind uh with achilles and Mm -hmm. having him you know have this unfortunate death and all this stuff that all of what he's what he's trying to do is if justice is one and good then we construct all of the conditions in which it would seem impossible to you to do harm to your friend. You would view it as your own goodness, your own justice to, to, to preserve the happiness of the entire, uh, the entire city. Absolutely. Like that. I think that's absolutely right. But I think in, in the insight, though, one of the insights is that that's the way every social grouping is to the extent that it's to the extent that it has unity. Okay. That's okay, a huge so, point. So, <laughs> so, I, I so 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 this is uh, uh, think about like the family, right? Where where the family the family has a unity that is, is it seemingly natural to it because that commonality of good is obvious to the members of the family. Like that, the happiness of the family is the happiness of the members who make it up. The happiness you know you, you, to enjoy the goodness of a happy family is for the others in the family to enjoy the happy family as well. Mm. Right. Okay. So, and that is maybe the most sort of fundamental experience of the kind of thing you're talking about Um, and where it's easiest to attain because there's a natural affection. Right. Yeah. Natural similarity, you know, similarity between and our, and our, and our, and I think our, I I think our instincts, our animal, our, our more animalistic instincts serve us there rather than hurt us Mm -hmm. you see like we're inclined we're like naturally inclined to treat our family this way right um that the trick 
or that the problem, it's not a trick, is is how to extend that sort of unity into bigger groupings that then can amass the amount of power that's necessary in order to sustain the kind of happiness that's possible in the family. Do you see what I'm saying? So 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 you have you have I think that I think that that's behind or at least partially behind uh, Socrates' move about how the guardians are going to have community of wives. Um, uh, because the reasoning is that, and he argues that, well, that way no one will really know who their family is. Or another way of putting it in the positive sense would be everyone, all the guardians think everyone else is their family. Like every kid thinks that all the men are their fathers, uh, you know, their, or at least their uncles or their, right? Like, and, and so you're extending... You're attempting to extend the sort of unity that you find in the family into a larger grouping. Does that make sense? Do you- totally. Yeah. So, so, and this is maybe book five when he's talking about we should have, um, there shouldn't be actually fam- family differences, that, that children should just believe that their parents could be any of the guardians. Right. And that there's not marital exclusivity as well. And so... <clears throat> when you have familial groupings that are that are different than each other, they have to have some means by which to be all one part of one city. But in the guardian class, let's imagine that there were none of those family differences, but they viewed the whole of the guardian class as their family, basically. And so you have those goods proper to families apart from each other now being in the entirety of the regime. Yeah, so there's two, there's two reasons why that's desirable, right? One is the positive reason that now we have the basis of familial unity in a bigger grouping. And then the flip side of that is that if you have independent families, then you have smaller groupings of human humans that are united to each other, which are at least to a certain degree rival regimes. So, so their interests can become at odds because you, 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 they, they mm-hmm. can be the kernels or the, the beginnings of factions. The families because the unity within the family is so profound got it okay so you yeah. have a positive sense of extending that profound unity into a larger group and the negative of avoiding the smaller groupings both of those mm. are, are, are attempt to be achieved you avoid the smaller groupings and you include into a larger group yep yeah all together right and and it it kind of extends that same thing with the guardians of not doing of just having this instinct of doing good to your friends and 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 uh, harm to your enemies, mm-hmm. because it then extends it into the guardian class of like well if they're all your family and you really exactly. can't tell that's the point it's like your your natural it's it's taking the natural instinct to do good to the friend and just uh, getting rid of the the kind of factional. Uh, this family versus that family of Montague and that, you know, and and it's incorporating it into one thing. Yeah. It's, it's a very, the move is very subtle and interesting, right? Because like that naive understanding of justice in the beginning to do good to your friends and harm your enemies. We're not even disputing that it's merely, okay. The enemies are outside. The friends are inside. So the first level of justice is for those guardians to harm their enemies and do good to their friends. Now we've we've now have a space of do good to your friends. Now we can discuss a like a second level order of justice within that space. Okay, you yep. right and 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 that um, so so neither neither the initial naive understanding of justice nor Thrasymachus's um, further explication of it neither of those are being disputed. They're being adopted and 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 moved forward with. So what we're seeing, and just to kind of recap, is that we're we're not really. It, it's not as though the book one insights on justice, the common notion of justice, Thrasymachus might make might makes right, is just like dismissed out of hand, and then you move on. Oh no, because it doesn't. It, it wouldn't make sense of the rest of it. It's like why are we talking about these things? Yeah. You have to then be going back and reference and saying how. It's not as though you just, it, it's like this, it's not as though the Republic reads as a kind of like series of arguments on justice. This one doesn't work. That one doesn't work. Next one might work. I don't know. Let's see where it goes. It's all of them are kind of like building. Like mm-hmm. it, it's more of a kind of like grander scale. It's getting larger and, uh, you know, eventually it gets to the, the idea of the philosopher king. But we can see how each of those notions of justice comes back uh, uh, throughout. Right. 
and 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 recap again this this movement from just self sufficiency, just everything's fine. We're the the hippie city of pigs. Mm-hmm. That that is taken as kind of a definitive moment where it's not that. At least to my mind, it has it is the case that men strive after higher things and luxuries. So now, where do we proceed? And we've provided two examples here of the guardian class, this kind of warrior friendship thing, and also the familial aspect of it Mm -hmm. in which Socrates is imagining, well, if it's going to be perfectly just, we have to have them all have those same instincts. And another one he talks about is private property. Mm -hmm. So that all property is held in common, which I think that's where Adiamantus jumps in and says, that's like, what benefit are you going to have as a guardian if all of your property is held in common? Like, how are you going to get people to be guardians right. if they can't get anything from it for their own private enjoyment? And and just to get to how he answers that, uh, it's because the problem of property being held in private is a source of division. Mm-hmm. Again, we're talking about the unity of the city internally. And if it's a source of division, then that has to be removed. It has to be a source of unity, all property held in common. And what eventually, if if it is all held in common, oh man, I'm trying to remember exactly with book five, uh, how he provides the reason for why the guardian should hold everything in common. So it's a source of division. Um, oh, I think that's where we get to the mixture of the elements. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's where we're going here is to the myths. Yeah, to the so, myths. So, so how, why, right. why would they do this well? Because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna them. produce a a ground for the internal justice um, that because that's what we're doing right we're figuring out how how to, how are we going to have an internal justice so in within the friends that can sustain the power of the city and the unity of the city and it's like well we're gonna have to introduce a mythology but that sounds like another conversation. Yeah, we'll probably leave the myth, but to uh, to get there, that private property is a source of division and a major one. Mm-hmm. And and actually, as Aristotle describes it in the politics, like that that is one of the major dividing things between people is wealth. And but Socrates doesn't. Uh, at that point, we have to move to myth. We have to move to. Uh, this can't be something that we just force upon them. We actually have to have them believe that property is to be held in common. Yes, we have to have them believe mm-hmm. that they they came from the earth. Mm-hmm. Each of the classes has elements mixed within them. And, and you know, I read an article by uh, Schofield uh, in the Cambridge Companion to the Republic, where he talks about the idea of the noble lie. We're we're getting eventually to the noble lie, probably mm-hmm. in the next episode. Right. Um, but he, he talks, he has this line where he says, Plato evidently sees no way of constructing a perfectly just city without a holistic political ideology. Now, that's very severe, mm-hmm. but I can see what he means. Like, and, and I think that'll be probably, you know, where we start in the next episode is, is mythology, mm-hmm. the uh, kind of ideological claims, if we're going to make kind of a modern take at it. Mm-hmm. You have Karl Popper's interpretation that right. the Republic presents a totalitarian vision mm-hmm. and all this stuff, which is typical of a liberal interpretation of the Republic. But, um, and really the the necessity of myth in the city, mm-hmm. which is something that I, I think a lot of like political science types and people are like, yeah, we do politics. And you never talk about, you have the secular separation of politics and religion which I think makes your politics pretty weak. <laughs> well, it makes it delusional, if you ask me. I mean, I think I, I, it's not, I don't think, I, I want to talk about myth in the next yeah. episode where we can do it more fully, but that Plato's not, the argument here is not that that a city ought to have a myth. <laughs> I mean, the argument is that from the very beginning when we're talking about justice is that is that no, there there is one. There is, yeah. Like, <laughs> and if you so, ignore so it, it's still there. So, exactly. so the liberals, I mean, they're just delusional. Yeah. Yeah. So in last episode, we dealt with kind of the intro passages, really the the problem or the conundrum of justice Mm -hmm. and trying to work through the kind of tautology that ends up happening with justice is doing good to friends and harming to one's enemies. Uh, Justice is whatever's in the, the interest of the stronger and how Socrates is pushing each of these definitions to show that that there's no there's no ground for justice. Yeah, there's no resolution. There's no resolution to the problem. 
We're just making it bigger and more complicated <laughs> yeah. or, or moving it. Sometimes. We're moving it to yep. the regime. Let's yep. say it's their interest, but what actually binds the regime itself together, mm-hmm. there has to be some justice there. Um, and we discussed the how Socrates moves the discussion from let's find the just individual to let's look at the just city. So in book three, we have the idea of the, the city of pigs. Mm-hmm. So where we have the, the self-sufficiency being kind of the motive for the development of the city. Uh, but Glaucon interrupts it and says, well, you know, Socrates, this isn't how, how actual cities are. Cities seek after luxury. They, they seek after grander mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. And that's where we introduce, uh, really, that's where justice and ju- injustice come back in, in, a, in, a, in a real way, because now you have war, you have competing factions within the city. And Socrates proceeds to start to imagine what would it look like to have a perfectly unified city, mm-hmm. meaning that is perfectly just. And uh, you have there the development of the, the, the guardian class, this kind of military warrior class. Uh, you have, uh, you know, if, if marital exclusivity and family can tear the city apart for seeking after unity of the city, they should be all held in common. Uh, private property should be all held in common. And, and it, what we're, what we're leading towards in, in this episode is going to be mythology or mm-hmm. the myths that, uh, keep the city together. So as he's kind of building this just city, providing descriptions of certain, uh, things that would have to be the case in, in the city. Now we have to say, what is going to be the myth that governs even the rulers that everyone believes to keep the city unified? Mm-hmm. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah because the, the, the problem is, obviously, that the auxiliaries, the warriors would have the power, have the, have the physical power to turn against the inside. Were they so inclined? So they need to be not so inclined. Right. So how do we make them not so inclined? You know, because because the the question here is, I, maybe this is worth maybe this is worth going on a little bit of a tangent, which, which is this that this that the city, the unified city, the just city, is would be a city in which the residents of the city, the members of the city, achieve their happiness. So they achieve like. The potential, the, the potential that they have towards um, some sort of excellence or some sort of virtue, happiness, proper order, harmony in their soul. And so, but the idea, of course, is or the acknowledgement for, for Plato, like everyone else who's not delusional, <laughs> is that human beings are different, right? People have different abilities, different capabilities, different potentials, different um a bit like different cultural um, cultural histories, all whatever they're different. They have mm. different potentials, different different forms of excellence is, are available to them. And so, if you're going to have a city that can maintain a certain amount of unity and power, therefore, you're going to need different types of people within it, right? And so, you need the workers, you need the the agricultural workers, you need the the technical workers, you need the the business guys you need the warriors you need the rulers you need these different groups within it so how is it that they are going to achieve um their their fulfillment within a hierarchical structure without turning against each other and extracting extracting wealth against each other from right. uh, extracting power from each other that's the that's like the problem mm-hmm. right so so you need the warrior class to look to look down at the say the the merchants or the workers and not see them as potential enemies but see them as friends and then if if we can do that then it's conceivable that those different groups will be able to achieve their perfection which is their proper order which will be um the proper order within the whole which would then be also the fulfillment of their um, their their personal perfection, so like their their ability to achieve internal harmony, and so happiness, right? In a kind of meritocratic sense, it's like yes, it's to each of their abilities they they are sorted into the different classes. But how do we get them all to you know function together? Yes, right, and and to accept their position within the whole, without resentment, without anger, without. Um, kind of like uh, faction forming coalitions against each other without, but to be, but to be happy 
in what they are in their in their the realization of their potential within the regime mm-hmm. right so that that is um yeah i mean that's that that seems to be the major problem and 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 so like when he says when they say that well the guardians aren't going to have private property and you and 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 the the complaint immediately is like come on that's so unrealistic <laughs> yeah. right because they they will want to amass wealth and it's like well if they do if they amass wealth then all bets are off we've done it we've we've destroyed it right like then it won't work so how how is it that they don't and that's where isn't it where we get the introduction of the myth the myth right and we right. have the, that's the <clears throat> so the myth is it has to be believed by everyone mm-hmm. including the rulers and the myth is that each uh that all of the people of the city state it came from you know mother earth and yeah the the, the a, a god who basically mixes different elements of each of the classes into the soul of the citizen so you have is it like bronze for the 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 farmers or the laborers yeah silver for merchants craftsmen you know that type of thing and then gold are for the guardian class for the kind of rulers of this society and i think an, an important thing he adds to that is that uh you can have someone who comes from a bronze family actually be gold and the guardians had to be on the look to to basically raise take those children from uh, the bronze parents and then raise them up into the guardian class. So you, right. so you have a kind of element in which the myth for the guardians also is for them to be attentive to seeing the elements in each of the souls and having them sorted properly. That's right. To have someone of exceptional ability not remain just a farmer because you could end up having resentment for the ruling class because he's stifled right it's almost it's like a perfect sorting of virtue via right. the myth yeah or potential it, virtue yeah right yeah, right. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean that, that ability g- ability yeah. yep yeah so so and, and it, but what's essential here though there's a couple points that are essential one is is that it's perceived the myth is not perceived to be myth mythical it it has to be understood to be nature itself and so um he sa- he talks. Socrates says, "Well, you know, we'll create a story, um, the magnificent myth." He says that would carry, convi- carry carry that would in itself carry conviction to our whole community, including, if possible, the guardians themselves. And then he's asked, "What sort of story?" Um, and then he says, "Nothing new, a fairy story, <laughs> like those the poets tell and have persuaded people to believe about the sort of thing that often happened once upon a time, but never does now, and it is not likely to." Okay, that he says, "I will," I, I said. Though I don't know how I'm to find the courage or the words to do so, I shall try to persuade first the rulers and the soldiers and then the rest of the community that the upbringing and education we have given them was all something that happened to them only in a dream. In reality, they were fashioned and reared and their arms and equipment manufactured in the depths of the earth and earth herself, their mother, who's, of course, a god to the Greeks, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Their mother brought them up uh, when they were complete into the light of day. So now they must think of the land in which they live as their mother and protect her if she is attacked. While their fellow citizens, they must regard as brothers born of the same mother earth. Right. Um, So we should tell our citizens the following tale. And then he goes on that that um, to talk about the myth of the metals, like you were just saying. So this is the way. Um, the, the, the children would normally resemble their parents, but not always. Sometimes a silver child will be born to a golden parents or a golden child to a silver parents and so on. Therefore, the first and most important of God's commandments to the rulers, again, that this is the divine law from Mother Earth, from the gods. Um, the first of the important of God's, most important of God's commandments to the rulers is that in the exercise of their function as guardians, their principal care must be to watch the mixture of metals and the characters of their children. If one of their own children has traces of bronze or iron in its makeup, they must harden their hearts, assign it its proper value, and degrade it to the ranks of the industrial and agricultural class where it properly belongs. Similarly, if a child of this class is born with gold or silver in its nature, they will promote it appro- appropriately to be a guardian or an auxiliary. Um, and this they must do because there is a prophecy that the state will be ruined when it has guardians of silver or bronze. Ah, uh, okay. So there's an additional prophecy myth. Well, the point yeah. is that the myth, the <laughs> myth is what what the myth that in order for this to work, the myth is which is which is um, the cosmos itself, right? It's not questioned, 
right? So it can't be, it can't be cynical. It can't be functional because if, if it is, if it is cynical, then we are just kicking the can down the road again, mm-hmm. right? So now we have the, um, now we have the 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 guardians or whomever doesn't believe in the myth manufacturing something to dupe the people below them into serving their interests but if that's the case we've moved war into the city right so now the extraction the extraction the exploitation is occurring in the city but we don't want it in the city we want exploitation outside the city and so the myth that the guardians have has to be the same myth as what the the classes under them have they share a mythology and the myth puts each of them in their place okay so that when you when you stop the common man on the street and you ask him like we were saying last time and you ask him what is good what is true what is false what is just what is unjust he says the same thing that the guardian says do you know you see what i'm like even when the guardian is in secret Right. Even (laughs) Mm -hmm. like even when the Guardian isn't isn't um, putting on a show, but it is actually telling the truth. He also believes in the metals and and that mythology then becomes. But but, but what's what's fascinating here? I mean, what is is sometimes this is referred to as like the noble lie and stuff. Right. But but often people are misunderstanding what's going on, because when you talk about the noble lie, it's sometimes construed as if the ruling class has some sort of lie for the underclass. Yeah, totally. Right? And it's a noble lie because it's good for them, right? Like like the ruling classes of 19th century Europe who don't really believe in Christianity anymore, but it's good for the masses to have Christianity because it's good to have moral citizens and they're happier, so it's sort of a noble lie. That is not what's happening here. No. The, the rulers themselves are convinced of the myth, right? So, and they must be. So that obviously is, 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 is raising, a, 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 introducing a massive problem in what Socrates is doing, because where does it come from? Absolutely. Right. Like where does the myth come from? He he presents himself as the fashion, the one who fashions the myth. Right. But if he's fashioning, if, so if you have somebody who is fashioning the myth and we've just gone through our whole idea of might makes right, then isn't the fashioner of the myth. In fact, the ruler who's, who's fashioning the myth for his own, benefit totally it's not the problem of the noble lie it's the noble liar yeah like, who's the one doing it? so who's the one who who not only who not only who not only can fashion the myth but has the power somehow to make it effectual like make it uh, affect it make it work to totally. make the people adopt it convince them that mother earth gave this to them right now this is a major problem and it's it's the reason why even in even in this this passage where the myth is introduced, we've already introduced the gods, right? Because it, it has to be the case, it has to be the case that the people who believe the myth believe it's divine, right? That it comes from the gods. But it, we know it's coming from Socrates. So Socrates is assuming the role of a divinity here, yeah. right? So um, now, so this this then raises I mean, you can you can see where this this doesn't it it doesn't solve the problem unless you have unless you can somehow find that guy, right? That guy who can make who can make the myths and have the myth be not for his own interest, but well, at least not it can be for his own interest if his interest is identical to the good itself, right? Mm-hmm. So so have the myth be. Um, be uh, an analog to justice itself or be ordered towards the realization of the fulfillment of all the people who live within the mythal, the mythical state. Right. So this is, this is the movement into the philosopher King, right? Which the is one which, who constructs the myth that all believe. Right. right. And again, we get, there's, there's an, there's a, there's a problem in the Republic, I think, because we will talk about the guardians as if they're the philosopher Kings, but they're not. No, very different. Right. And, um, and even when they're trained into philosophy, it, there's, there's many sort of giveaways in the text that, that their philosophy is really just a deeper, a deeper explication of the mythology. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not moving past the mythology. It really seems like their virtue is prudence, but a prudence guided by the myth that's already been given to them. Mm-hmm. So, so they're, they're very prudent, virtuous rulers who are intelligent and warrior, but they're not constructing a myth. 
like they're the guardians in book four and it is especially to glaucon like glaucon wants there to be you know his version of a philosopher king would just be the guy who's a very active political but like virtuous ruler mm-hmm. but when when the philosopher king's introduced it's very different like it, it comes after the the defining of myths that the guardians believe it mm-hmm. comes at a point in which you realize that it's not sufficient to just have very virtuous guardian um uh guardian caretakers of the regime uh, there has to be something even grander that all of them believe together. And that's where the philosopher king has to enter and, and being different from that. Right. And he's he's categorically different. He, I mean, this is what I don't know. I think that there's unresolved problems in the book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 in order to understand it, we have to shift, I think, in, in, into later in the book where we talk about the uh, the allegory of the cave. Right. Um, and. uh I mean, I mean, briefly, the, the, I'll, I'll try to recount the allegory of the cave real fast here. I mean, so, the, the idea is is this, is that Socrates paints this picture where he says, okay, imagine, imagine that there's um, a group of people, a group of men, and they're in a cave, deep in a cave, the bowels of a cave. And they're, they're, they're strapped in such a way, and their head is strapped in such a way that they're facing a wall, and they can't turn and face the other direction. And there is a fire behind them. And then there are, the gist of it is there's objects that are moved between the fire and them. And the shadow, therefore, of those objects is cast on the wall in front of them. So they see the shadows moving past. And he asks the question, he says, if, if, that, if, that, if that was their whole world, if they had lived there their whole lives and they were strapped, they would perceive that the shadows on the wall were reality itself, right? And it's like, okay, but they're not, is it reality itself? Well, no, but is it completely divorced from Real, it's like, well, the, there really is an object back there. They're seeing a shadow of the object, right? But the object, so the object has a, 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 an existence that even the object itself has an existence that goes past what they're seeing, right? So now what he says is, is that, okay, imagine, imagine that one of these men is unstrapped, taken off, taken out, um, and then is, is turned around to face the fire, and he would be blinded by the fire. It would be overwhelming. He would think that he can see less, right? He would think it would be worse. Then if you push him further and you, and you drag him out of the cave and you drag him up into the, up into the daylight, he would be um, completely blinded. He wouldn't be able to see. He wouldn't understand. And that he would Im- initially think that the world he was experiencing was more false than that he was seeing a delusion or a dream or th- that this isn't real, that what's real mm. was the world he grew up in the cave and that this is a, f- a fictitious, you know, illusion of some sort. Totally. Right. And then if he was compelled to spend time there, then he would come to perceive reality, the, the reality on the surface. And if he were there long enough, he would eventually be able to perceive the sun itself, the source of light. Okay. And so the the, the allegory is, this obviously he's talking about how the the social reality is is a is a can, it has a sort of closeness to it or a sort of coherence to it because it is a shadow of the reality right and so it has it has you can be you can mistake it for the world itself and then but and and, and the movement out of that that closed world where you feel at home into higher levels is a painful, arduous one that no man undertakes on his own, right? So he talks about the the man has to be compelled, has to be dragged. He says dragged, right? right? Like he's fighting. He doesn't want to go up into the light. And once he once he goes into the light, then he 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 perceives the world more directly, closer to the sun, the sun, the source of goodness. It's an allegory. Um, and then he says, and then the, 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 the next step then is that he then has to be, he doesn't want to go back in the cave once he realizes that. Right. Right. <laughs> but he needs to be compelled, somehow compelled to go back into the cave, um, to go back to his old companions. And now when he goes back to his old companions, what does he do? Right, he now he now has surpassed their law, their world, their closed circ- their closed world. But if he tells them about, if he just comes out and tells them about what he saw, what are they going to think? I mean, they're going to think he's nuts. They're going to think it's a, a delusion that he's a madman, mm-hmm. right? So he has to he has to 
um, somehow create an analogy or a metaphor or a, a mythology of truth and of justice within the world that they inhabit, right? And so rule them within their own world, right? Totally. With his own images. Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, with something that can displace those images. And just a, a thought I had on when he's outside the cave, I think the it brings back this, you know, distinction between nature and convention <clears throat> conversation we've had, because mm -hmm. I think the first step is as you're becoming acclimated to the, the sun, mm -hmm. the realization that it is a cave. Like that, that seems to be the first element of the philosophical move outside the cave. Totally right. Yeah. Is, is the recognition of how much of your world was cave <laughs> was part of the human construction. And also I think we've talked about this, like the, you, you still don't get a pure apprehension of, of the sun, of the good itself. Well, this is the problem. Yeah. I mean, this is the problem with the whole system. I think is that it, again, we fall into an infinite regress problem, right? So, so if, if somebody, if the, if the philosopher King has to have been unshackled and dragged up to the surface so that he can then see the good and then go back in and rule the city, then who's dragging him out? Okay. Like, so who's dragging him out? Well, some other philosopher, I suppose, right? <laughs> so, but how is that guy dragged out and, and, and so on and so forth. Mm. And, and, and the problem, the, the other problem is that, is that when you turn, when the, when the philosopher turns, he, he, when, the, when the potential philosopher is unstrapped and turns and face, faces the, the fire, um, the fire is blinding to him and then he acclimates to it. And then he does it again. And it's like, well, if, if, if if he were if he were to take one of his companions down in the cave and unstrap them and turn them to the fire right they experience that blindness that need for acclimation all of that sort of stuff that the that the philosopher king experienced on the surface but what you're saying is he never actually even on the surface he never actually perceives the totality of the good right he only perceives a higher level to it. So the point is, are you ever out of the cave or are you, are you merely moving into higher levels in the caverns? Do you see what I'm bigger, saying? Bigger lights. Bigger lights. Yeah. Bigger lights. And, and, and it's always the case that, uh, that somebody from the level higher is dragging you up to their level, but they themselves can't drag themselves higher than where they are. Mm -hmm. And they're not gods themselves. So they're men which means the guy who dragged you up to the surface, he went down to you, but he hasn't been dragged higher. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. And right. so, and so you're, are you out of it or are you merely, is it merely that the philosopher, the potential philosopher King who's been dragged out of the cave into the next level higher has now been given a mythology about nature, about philosophy that, that then demands like he's like Socrates says, well, how do we get that? How do we get the guy to go back down? And oh, he says, right, yeah. and he goes, well, we tell him a story about how the city, um, the city uh, gave him all this education and that he owes it. And we, we tell, basically we tell him the story of the medals. And so it's like, but so, so you get the philosopher to go back down with a myth, you know? And so is there makes the myth <laughs> is the reality that he's in when he's up at the top, simply a higher level mythology that that is really an extension of the same mythology that governed at the bottom and it's like it seems to be the case it seems to be right. the case so how do we break out of that cycle or how do we and and this is the reason why i think throughout it throughout these parts of the text the gods are are introduced i mean that the, the socrates will say things about about divine intervention about the miracles about like this is impossible without a miracle do you know? <laughs> yep. And so there's a, but, but who, but is there really a miracle? Are there really gods or, or are the gods, is it always the case that the guy who comes from the above is presented as if a God, right? Because like Socrates with the myth of the metals, he's the one produce, he's the one producing the law, which is taken to be the divine law. So he's assuming the role of a God, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And th there's a point in being dragged back 
that Socrates then says, okay, and, and, but the man who gets dragged back is miserable because yep, he doesn't want to be seen, there. He doesn't want to be there. And it's yeah. because he has to get acclimated again to the darkness. Right. And he has to realize he has to craft his own images mm -hmm. and he has to compete in law courts, as Socrates will say, and have to fight over the shadows of justice. Exactly. Because it, and, and, and that's it, like, I, it's very tragic. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, the whole thing is extremely tragic. And I mean, the idea of the multiple caves. Right. But you, you come back to the cave that you've been compelled to by another myth to come back to. Right. And when we should say here, there's, there's no, there's no idea here of like, everyone gets out of the cave. No way. I mean, you have to go back and then cr craft what you've learned from, you know, a further cave up or maybe the sun or wherever you can get it. Yeah. Uh, within the convention that's there. Because You're this the idea that we established in the beginning that power produces justice, we, we haven't disputed. So like the city, the structure, the social structure of the community in the cave is the source of the truth that they're going to live according to. Right. So you, you, you and that, that doesn't change the philosopher, the, the philosopher somehow moves outside of it. Somehow it's mysterious, right? Somehow he's dragged from above because there's no way to break out from, from below. No. He's dragged from above out of the relative into a relatively less relative. <laughs> right. And then compelled to go back in. So you, there is no escaping the myths. You can't. I mean, not for the society because power is always the source. And one man, one man can't wield the power necessary to produce a socially constructed justice. So, so the, the socially constructed justice is always going to be mythical. Right. That's also tragic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe to, to stick on the, the who, who makes the myth? Who is the one, you know, they've, because in that way you become a kind of sophist and orator. Like I think, you know, he talks about oratory mm -hmm. and that it gives you this power to placate the masses and you just basically are flattering them and persuading them. But the philosopher king who comes back to the cave, he doesn't really have another option than to use rhetoric and deception to really get people to to will the good. Like you, you come back to the cave, you craft the images and the reason it's noble is because there is a higher order justice that you're trying to bring about. But the only way that men would will to uh, ascend to that myth of that regime, uh, to the higher justice is if they were deceived into it. If there was some myth, like you can't just present true justice to them. No, they, they would. The, the, they would feel that that's an affront. Too. They would. He says earlier they would crucify you. I mean, the truly just man in a relatively unjust world, right? Like who brings justice in is mm. is is attacked as a criminal. So even so, though he's the most just, that's the yeah right. So thing. so you have to bring in you like you're saying you have to articulate the higher truth in the idiom of the lower truth. Okay, which means in the idiom of like we're saying in the idiom of mythologies, the idiom of, of really rhetoric where the philosopher is sort of forced to become a sophist, basically. Like he, he's, yep. he's compelled to use sophistry in order to try to elevate people beyond their current condition into a proper, a, a more just order, mm -hmm. right? Well, you can see there the, the philosopher who seeks to know the one, to have his soul unified in justice and goodness, to be duplicitous to that degree has to be miserable. He, right? he, he like says you have to be it, it has to be something that you're forced into because no philosopher would willingly do that. Well, if, he, if he rhetoric. did, he would no longer be the philosopher. Like it's part of like it's part of the way you identify the philosopher is he's the one who who doesn't want to do it, who won't do it. Right? And Plato says that multiple times in the book. Like he, the philosopher king is the one who doesn't want to rule, who doesn't want to do it. He doesn't seek it. And in fact, I, there's even places where I think he refuses to do it. Like there's mm -hmm. there's places, multiple places where the this this sort of tragic unfolding of the story reaches a a a a, 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 a level of tragedy where where it's it becomes impossible. 
Well, no, no philosopher will 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 accept that role. He would rather be killed, right? Yeah, make the perfect mythology, create a guardian class, do complete political recreation of the city, wipe it clean, you know, send exile most people, raise the children, have a perfect education. It's just like, yeah, you don't want to be signed up for that. <laughs> no, because because the higher level, the higher you ascend towards the good, you want to contemplate the good. You want to exist at the higher level, not the lower levels. Um, but in the ideal, so I think in the ideal world, which is what we're talking about, this mm-hmm. is a big thought experiment on whether or not we can understand what 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 a just city look like you would have the the philosophers the the rulers there would be a a, a sort of uh the the mythology that governs the different classes would be analogs of one mythology so 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 in all of those are analogs of the good itself so if you could have the good itself kind of flow down and through the cavern, the layers of the caverns, and there's different mythologies that are, but they're, they're different mythologies are different manifestations of the same um, grand sort of master myth, which is this master analogy to the prime analogate, which is the good itself. You see, right? Mm-hmm. So, so that if you could do that, you would have the just society. You could have the just society that goes all the way down to the peasants all the way down to the lowest level of the cave. Right. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the ideal. Now the problem, there's many problems here, right? Many, one of them of course, is that every level thinks it's at the highest level, every, whatever level you are, right. Everything above you, you perceive to just be nature itself. It's just the trees and the sun and the thing, you know, it's like, all right. So that means that if every level perceives itself to be at the highest level, then everything above it, is perceived to be, um, it, it can't be judged. Okay, so <laughs> so again, how do you know it can't be judged by the standards of that of, of the level at which you are? Right. You see what I'm saying? So the people yeah. at the bottom of the, staring at the, the shadows and the philosopher king comes down and is talking to them in their own mythology and showing them shadows, they don't know if, what he's, if he's lying to them or not. They don't have the resources to do that, mm-hmm. right? All they know is whether or not they're happy. Right, but the world they live in and the world the philosopher is giving them per- is perceived by them as being like 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 Socrates says uh, from Mother Earth itself, right? Like from the nature itself. So mm-hmm. you have so that means that the 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 whole thing has to begin from somehow from above. The whole thing has to come from above, and it's the infinite regress pro- problem. Yeah. Where, where's the above? Where right? does it come from? And I, I mean, it, it has to be, and he, he, he has hints at it. It has to be the gods. Like they're, I, I think <clears throat> part of it, I think as well is that convention itself leads to an impious understanding of the gods. Mm-hmm. Like the, it, it is the case when he's talking about the, the poets who have all these terrible story about the gods and Kronos eating his children, whatever, right. that they are reflecting the injustice they wish to the people wish to do onto their divine right so so yeah, the, yeah, there yeah. ends up being that namas or law or convention um leads you to an understanding of the gods as unjust because you're unjust and and you treat them as you know if i had unlimited power i would do this too because see, this you're is, this unjust is, in the soul this is right? inevitable so so like what he says is when he talks about um, sending the guardians, so the guardians get this kind of philosophical education, right? But, but we, now we've relativized philosophy. I mean, we've, we've just said all philosophy is not the same. <laughs> okay? mm-hmm. So you're, you're, it's a higher level education within the, the structure, but it's not all the way to the top because no one actually achieves that. But when those guardians are, he, he says, okay, so they've been educated and then they'll, they'll be sent down back down into the cave. And he says this, okay, they'll be sent back down into the cave when they're young to be the auxiliaries, to be the soldiers, okay? Um, and so now they've, they've got the mythology, they've seen enough of the light in order to have the mythology that compels them to go back down and be the warriors. And then when they get older, they'll, they'll be brought back up and, and educated further, right? And then will be sent back down as the higher levels, the guardians themselves, the philosopher kings, now like they're, they're perceived as the philosopher kings in the city, um, and then when they die, he says, they'll be made gods. But this is what you're getting at. It's necessary 
that to the city who was under the the philosopher under the guardians that the guard that the, that what you're saying is that they have the creation of the stories of the gods this the myths mm-hmm. of the gods in an unjust city that manifests itself in the corrupt stories that the poets spin about the totally. gods mm-hmm. right because the powers that govern them are erratic and irrational and unjust and corrupt the power that is providing their justice but in the just city that power would not be corrupt right mm-hmm. and which so you're still going but that doesn't change the fact that the source of the order must be seen to those who are under it as if it's divine even though we know they're just men I mean, doesn't yep. Socrates doesn't yep. say that they are gods. He says that we must uh, institute temples for them and sacrifices, and people perceive them as gods. Got it. So if you have perfectly just philosopher kings who they are sent as guardians into, uh, sorry, their their main auxiliaries, their warriors, then they're elevated up. Yep. They will become the gods of the future regime. That's right. They have to. That's how. That's their that, and that's how they're the source of the myth. That's believed as yeah. coming from Mother Earth herself. That the gods, the gods themselves, gave us this myth. And it's like, yeah, the gods, those those guys, <laughs> the who, the guys who were here a hundred years ago. Got it. Yeah, right. no, that makes sense. That makes sense. And and it also makes sense why he says you'll uh, to wipe. You have to start by wiping the city clean. You have to exile basically everyone currently in the city and just have the children and then educate them into it. Because right. from there you can start it. Yes, that's like, right. But you you can't start it with the existing regime. Unless you're able to totally deceive it, and you know it, it's it's harder that way. But <laughs> but but I mean, the real sort of tragedy is that you were getting at earlier mm-hmm. is that the philosopher, the more true of the more complete of a philosopher a man is, the more you can't get him to fulfill this role. Do you see what I'm saying? Like totally. like the reason you can get the young auxiliaries to go down is they're not very good philosophers. No. The the reason why you can get the guardians to go back down is they're slightly better, but you get a guy who's who's contemplating the good at a higher level and like you said he just says no and 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 he's just not interested in it and that's why he says that that the true philosopher opts out of public life right right he doesn't he's not interested in it he doesn't want to be a part of it mm-hmm. right <clears throat> just an example it reminds me of uh the grand inquisitor and dostoevsky because mm-hmm. he has this whole uh, part where the Grand Inquisitor talks about being out in the desert and wishing the good for humanity and all this stuff, but he's seeing that it won't come about. So he decides to become this grand cardinal and mm-hmm. basically trick all the people into being happy and good using the church to do it. And it's Ivan's you know thing against Alyosha, but it reminds me of that same figure that the one who has perceived true philosophy, but as Socrates says, there's no regime that lives up to the philosophic nature. Mm-hmm. And because it's the case that no regime actually fulfills the philosopher's nature, he remains to be useless, to not want to be in the city, to be always kind of outside the regime, to be always under suspicion. I mean, it's it's not as though, uh, you know, the, the, uh, you know, you have your little philosophy department at a university or something like that. Like philosophers as a group in the city states and the Greeks, they were seen with a little bit of suspicion from the regime because it's like, are these people being atheists, impious, overthrowing our power. Because in their very nature, they are transcending the law of the city, right? So so when when you move past the law of the city to the people who are under the law of the city, that is, for the people who are under the law of the city, and I, when I say under it, I don't mean I'm, I'm, I'm submitting to it. I mean like living in it. So mm-hmm. that we're talking about the deep law. We're not talking about statute. We're talking about the the the, the socially constructed milieu, the law, the, the, the society, justice itself. To those people, somebody who's questioning the bound, the questioning or seemingly undermining the structure of the regime, the city, you can't tell the difference. I mean. You, there's no way of, distur- of determining between someone who's going to be a tyrant and someone who's going to be a benevolent ruler. There's no way of determining. I mean, they just look like they're undermining it. Do you see? Like, there's no, totally. there's there's the the suspicion. Uh, there's no like we were saying earlier. There's no grounds from within the regime to judge those who are moving past it. Do you see what I mean? So so the the, the philosopher is highly suspicious. That's why he wants to fade away. He wants to be right. invisible. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> right. And it would have to be some god who compelled him to take charge. And also the condition that Socrates provides in book five 
is that the city has to be willing to obey. But see, this is a trap. Yeah. Because if the city is willing to obey the philosopher king as such, then the city is made up of philosophers. Yeah, right. Who've who've already gotten so, past the cave? Yeah. Side so of it. so they 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 when he says that the well when he says well it's not impossible that we'd have a philosopher king he goes I mean it's conceivable that that a city it would be impossible in a city that didn't obey him freely so it's like well okay it's conceivable that we could have this ideal regime where everybody is just so when I say everybody's a philosopher I don't mean I mean that it, 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 the 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 if you had a regime in which the, the different levels, the different metals, the people from the different metals were all fulfilling their potential fully, right, to wherever they were. Then part of that potential is the obedience to that which is higher, right? Okay, and mm -hmm. so if they were fulfilling their wisdom as much as they could, so you had a perfectly wise society, then it's conceivable that the guy at the top would be the wisest, right? And that they would admit, they would obey him you see, so, but, totally. but then, so, in, but you have to have a just, but you see, that's a, that's a paradox because in order to have the philosopher King who can produce the mythology that will produce the just city, he has to have the power to do so, but he'd only have the power to do so in a just so city, in a just society. See, it's a, it's a, oh, it's a circular, it. yeah. it's a circular paradox. Circular paradox. And those keep recurring. <laughs> like, well, they, it happens over and over again in the Republic. Yeah. I mean, I'm right when I feel like you're reading it and you're right when you feel like you're getting somewhere, then the rug is pulled out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, so, okay. So if we could back up then with the idea of the philosopher King as such, and, and I think a kind of common reading, like uh, the idea that, what Plato's Plato's political philosophy is philosophers should just rule. And yeah. that, that's like a typical, you know, but that's, that's just, that's just to say nothing. I mean, every regime thinks that, I mean, this it, it's another, it's just sort okay, of truism. So, if, so, if so it's, it's like, the philosopher knows the form of the good and then instantiates a perfect law. That's just a description but, of but what regimes assert say, themselves to be. It just, it just, it just, it, it, it sidesteps the entire question of political philosophy because to say the philosopher ought to rule, is to say the city ought to be the type of place that accepts the rule of a philosopher. Yes, totally. Okay. I mean, I mean, <laughs> you see what I'm like the, you, the, the, the political philosophy can't be, um, which is, which is again, people would say, well, well, how do you do that? And I go, well, you have to have a philosopher ruler to make the people, the type of people who would accept a philosopher ruler. Oh, okay. Right, I mean, right. you, know, you know, you know, like to, to say that philosophers ought to rule. It's like, well, of course, Mm -hmm. Of course, we ought to have a, a society that pursues truth and, and whose relative whose relative justice is aimed past itself into a relatively less relative justice and so on all the way in the pursuit of the prime analogate, the truth, the good itself. I mean, of course, that's the case. And that that in that in such a scenario, every every distinction in wisdom where anyone who had more wisdom than another would be the leader of the one who had less wisdom and that would culminate with any similar. It's like, that's just, to me, that's just, um, uh, that's just a sort of obvious um, description of what a just society would look like. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's not, that doesn't, the, the, the political problem is, well, how is it possible that we can do that? Yes, right. And and Socrates has this line where he says, uh, there's one thing we shall, you know, be ready to fight over. It is when the muse of philosophy is mistress in the city that the regime we have described could ever come about. And it's the idea that they're had they're they're almost prior to their being able to be ruled by a philosopher, they have to have a kind of piety to the gods that could allow it to happen. Like and, and I think it, go, it goes along with what you're saying about like this regress of like, okay, you would have to have them already be philosophers, but how do they already be philosophers? Well, you have to have a philosopher ruling them and you're in right. this kind of circle. Right. But it, it, it does seem, it seems that I, I think at least that Plato believes the initial move of philosophers being brought out of the cave is some divine action. Well, Something, it has to be. It has to be. If it happens at all. If it does. So right. it could be, you could take a cynical read. Yes. And you could you say there is all there is are men masquerading as gods. So the same sort of way that the guardians are made gods, 
right? And they make, and they're the source of the myth for the city over which they rule that the people who elevated, educated the guardians, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's always men masquerading as gods, yeah. which in, in which case it's just sort of masks all the way down, manipulation all the way down. Yeah. Um, will to power all the way down, right? Like that's a move that could be made. Mm -hmm. That is not the move I think that Plato is doing. That's no, not what Plato is doing. I think he does believe that, and I, and I think it happens with Socrates and his initial, the Oracle, Adelphi, and, and the Daemon, and this this kind of like, it seems as though the gods are pulling him out. Or, or And we, we talked about this before. It, it, when Socrates' God speaks to him, it's not actually providing him a myth. Mm -hmm. It's just negating, telling him, don't do these things, right, don't right. think this way. Right. Um, and... It's it's kind of that the god is 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 pulling you out of each of these steps, mm -hmm. uh, and and I, and I think so. I think also if we if we're reflecting on Socrates' life as a whole, which Plato is in all the dialogues describing, he doesn't actually fit the idea of the useless philosopher, because the useless philosophers are out outside the city thinking and contemplation and stuff, mm -hmm. but Socrates is walking around dialoguing with people, and. And not actually attempting to create the ultimate myth, but but more more or less just negating what they do believe. <laughs> yeah, like he's right. he's kind of revealing the the cave to them mm -hmm. in his discussions, mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem to me that the philosopher king is like the 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 culmination of the political thought in the Republic as like this is what Plato's political philosophy is presenting this no. to me. That just doesn't seem to be the case. It, it seems as though kind of the initial insight, you know, you get this in the Gorgias, to to suffer injustice is better than to commit injustice. It's almost as if when the philosopher does return to the cave and try to make other men more just from what he knows, mm -hmm. that it will bring him injustice from others. It will it will bring it will bring calamity upon him because he he's challenging the justice of the actual regime. Mm-hmm but he still has to act justly like he um i i don't what i'm saying here is i think there's two paths here i think there is a kind of cynical political path where it's i know i don't fully have the myth i know i i know i don't ha fully have the form of the good but i have to communicate it in myth mm -hmm. in deception in rhetoric i have to craft images so I will for the people's benefit, even if I'm wicked doing it and mm -hmm. be duplicitous. Right. But I think the other one is I choose not to, but I still dialogue and try to lead people to true justice. And I communicate in their idiom, but not not in the grandest philosopher king sense. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, and this is just in the like the position of like the individual philosopher approaching the city, something like that. Right. Now, I think on the, the grand scale, what you're describing, uh, you know, philosopher kings up here and then... Um, and the people who can only receive it in the idiom, I think that problem still remains. I think that's just the tragedy of I think being it's a, a philosopher. I think, in the I city. think there's a tragic. Yeah, there's a there's a the the I think the takeaway in the end, the plot structure of the Republic from a political philosophy point of view, there's a lot of st yeah. other stuff going on in the Republic, but is tragedy, is that like there is a good, there is justice, there is a transcendent justice, there is a good, there is good uh, good and evil morality, there is such a thing. Right. And, and, and to live according to it is to be happy. And that is what human beings strive after. But alas, I can't figure out how to, <laughs> like, it doesn't seem like it's possible in, no. in, in, in the, in the city itself. Right. And so you have, um, like at the, uh, um, after he's talking about, and we haven't, we haven't talked about the regime forms. And I think we should yeah. do that on a different, uh, let's do that a different yep. time. That's, but Let's talk about that at a different meeting yes. because we need more time for that. But towards the end of that section, he says, um, and he's talking about the potential philosopher king. Um, he's talking about the philosopher king, how he would react, the philosopher to honors, right? Public or private. And he says, if he thinks they will make him a better man, he will accept and enjoy them. If he thinks they will destroy the order within him, he will avoid them. And then his interlocutor says, if that is his object, he won't enter politics. And he goes, oh, yes, he will. I replied, very much so in a society where he really belongs, but not, I think, in the society where he's born, unless some miracle happens. 
Again, it's like that divine yeah. inter- intervention. <laughs> I see what you mean, he said. You mean that he will do so in the society which we have been describing and which we have theoretically founded, but I doubt if it will ever exist on earth. And then Socrates says, perhaps, I said, it is laid up as a pattern in heaven where he who wishes can see it and found it in his own heart. But it doesn't matter whether it exists or ever will exist. In it alone and in no other society could he take part in public affairs. Wow. All right. So (laughs) the philosopher king is like you were, this is what you were Mm -hmm. saying, is is like, oh, he could be the king of of this society. But but really what we've just done is created a model of justice for that the philosopher himself can contemplate. And now he's going to contemplate it within himself and achieve that level of insider enlightenment, that philosophical life. But he's not, that doesn't translate to the creation of the Republic, the just city. Yes. Right. So the just city then, if it's elusive and seemingly impossible given the circumstances, then what we're really always in are, is this, degree these degrees of falsehood degrees of corruption degrees of the, it's not a noble lie it's just a lie mm-hmm. <laughs> right of manipulation within the within the regime and that's where when we start talking about the regime forms and the decline of the the, the, the different regime forms and the way in which they decline it starts to make sense the way he mm-hmm. talks about that that there could be a regime that he could actually participate in its justice because it is justice mm-hmm. and not rule it with a false justice right and 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 you know part of this as well i think is um you know the corruption of the philosophic soul he he spends a good deal of time on that because Mm -hmm. you know plato had students in the academy and you know socrates has you know alcibiades became a you know a a figure and 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 then you have people like thersimachus and callicles and the gorgias who take a kind of like it's the right of the stronger you know it's better to commit injustice and it and Socrates says it's not that they were false philosophers all along. It's not as though these, my students, which I saw this philosophical spirit within, um, that they were just false and we figured it out later. But rather because the regime is so corrupt that it corrupts the nature of the philosopher. That the philosopher has to use things like the noble lie and sophistry and rhetoric like Callicles becomes yeah, exactly. an orator he ends up he was a student of Socrates and ends up mm-hmm. being a student of Gorgias and in, in, mm-hmm. in the Gorgias Thrasymachus is an orator right like others it, it is him also saying that the philosopher because the regime is so bad and he can't actually fit within it that his nature becomes corrupted his nature becomes corrupted because of what we know of just like virtue and vice theory. I mean, just through the repetition of, of, of immoral habitual acts. lying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, <laughs> habitual lying, you can become a liar. But, but the other thing is that he become the philosopher who, the philosopher who has insight into a level or two levels deeper of the law becomes powerful because his rhetoric becomes, he becomes capable of manipulating it right in a way that the people who are more naively live in it cannot. Totally. Right. And so the distinction between a philosopher and a tyrant becomes mm, very subtle. Right. Like, <laughs> and from and from the position of those below him, indistinguishable. Right. Like the, the, mm. that <clears throat> they, they can manipulate. An he can manipulate the, the either direction. And the people being manipulated don't know. I mean, they don't understand that they're being manip- that they're being manipulated out of the law either in the interests of the orator, right? Yep. Or in the interests of themselves through a philosopher, right? They don't know. They, they're not in a position to judge or they'd be the philosopher. So, so, the, so the, you see, so the line between the philosopher and the tyrant is, is razor thin. Starts to get, yeah, really close. And, even and, so, the and so the temptation feels- then of the, philo- the philosophic man mm-hmm. who is not only developing these habits and these skills of manipulation, but is also... In engaging in the power that 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 brings is corrupted totally and they, they become the worst he says yep and i think that that probably brings us to regime forms yeah and, yeah. and you said <laughs> yeah. i think that's that's worth doing a a full I episode agree. on I totally and then agree. kind of wrapping it as as kind of a whole mm-hmm. um but yeah just to sum up so we've discussed justice in the initial the friend enemy uh we've discussed the kind of 
the different positions on it and ultimately this kind of same problem we're running back into which is this you push it a little bit further but it's still kind of cyclical Mm -hmm. it still is tautological within itself um the I, you know, we talked about the different, the city of pigs, uh, the, the luxurious city, and then today, you know, mythology and, Mm -hmm. and how the myth has to be believed by every class within the myth, the mixture of the elements, uh, and who actually is the myth maker (laughs) and, and the analogy of the cave, uh, and, and the potential of bigger caves. And then, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the philosopher King and that kind of extremely cynical path possibly open there um, and and how to kind of interpret that within a bigger framework. Right. Yeah. And then next time will be regime forms and how, how really an analysis of the city and kind of a, a, a final look at justice having gone through the whole of it. Right. And I think importantly also the myth at the very end. Yeah. Right. Uh, of I the agree. rewards of injustice mm-hmm. that it does seem like through all of it, uh, there is still the recommendation of practicing justice. Even oh, if- definitely. Because, because like we were saying, Socrates is not, the, the, the Plato, Socrates here, the assertion is not, uh, I, I think it is a misreading to read him as, as the cynic. Like, I, I think that he thinks that justice in the soul is actually the good that it is never in your interest to trade away. Right? I, I, I believe that. I, I don't awesome. see how you can read the Platonic dialogues and not believe that, that, that <laughs> yeah. he thinks that. I think that's... Not have it hit you in the face a that, lot of times. That is, yeah. Totally. Right. Well, we'll do that next time. Okay. But thank you, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. We'll uh, see you next time.